Warning, the Catholic Man Show contains high levels of manliness. It's simple, really. You either want to grow in virtue and holiness, or you want to be a sissy whiny baby. If you choose to move forward, grab your whiskey glass, because the Catholic Man Show is starting right now. Welcome to the Catholic Man Show. We're on the Lord's team, the winning side. So raise your glass. Adam Minahan here sitting in studio. Dave to my right, Juan on the buttons. We got Jim hanging out by the door, making sure no one's going to break in. We have a very special guest. I'm super excited about this episode. Every once in a while on the Catholic Man Show, we take our, we're big fans of tradition. We are. Yeah. We love tradition. We love totally. ceremony, especially the sacred kind. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. But every once in a while, we take our traditions and we put it aside, and we just kind of go uh, off the beaten path. It's a tradition that we have of every of once in a while going off of stepping tradition. aside from. Yes, and so what we do is we talk yeah. to a talk to somebody who we feel like is an expert in their craft. We've had, we've talked to Father. Or, I'm sorry, not Father Mark Gillespie from uh, Whiskey Cast. We've talked to uh, Liam N- Liam Hoffman. Hoffman. I want to say Nielsen. That would have been uh, from totally different dude. Totally different dude. Uh, that guy's black, killed a lot more he's people. He's a black blacksmith, <laughs> not in real life. No, not in um, real life. I mean, that I know of. That we know of. Yeah. And uh, today we we have a chance. The guys who've been on the Catholic Man Show camp out will know our guest this after this evening. But Absolutely. we have. Uh, Mr. George Carpenter. George, thank you so much. It's, we've talked about doing this for over a year now, and we finally have had the opportunity mm-hmm, mm-hmm. to sit down. And it's been it's a perfect timing because you just finished a project that we'll we'll be talking about today. But I'm so grateful to have oh, you on the show. I'm so excited to be here. It's really? gonna be a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. Before we get into the episode, I need a okay. I need to uh, make a correction. Really, to something that took place in. The last episode that was a hundred. Actually, it actually will be two episodes ago. Two episodes because ago. Because Cut Doctor Cutback was correct. Last episode. Two episodes ago. Mm-hmm. Um, that was not my fault, even though I said it. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. It's the, the jury's out on whose fault it was, <laughs> even though I was the only one involved. Okay. <laughs> um, we were talking about canon law. With okay, Father with, David, with Webb. Father David Webb, mm-hmm. and I said something that was not true what i said was that a feast day if it is the feast of the patron of the cathedral of your diocese is elevated to a solemnity and i think i used the example in new york saint patrick's day because their cathedral is saint patrick's cathedral is elevated to a solemnity this is not in fact the case it's elevated to a feast from a memorial or you know uh, so if, if it's a memorial day it's elevated to a feast day if it's a feast day, it remains a feast day. It's not elevated a to a solemnity. So uh, I just want to make a correction ab- about that. Now, uh, the uh, f- feast of the patron of your parish is a solemnity. Um, so, like, we go to St. Benedict's. Um, Shout out to Father Brooks and right, Porter. Right. In fact, in fact, there's a St. Patrick's Parish in Sand Springs here in, in uh, nearby Tulsa, Oklahoma. So the thing about St. Patrick's Day, the reason it's it's like a big one and I use that as an example, is because it always takes place in Lent, okay? And so the solemnities that occur in Lent, in Lent like those are prized, they're coveted, okay? So if you are a parishioner of St. Patrick's here in Sand Springs, on St. Patrick's Day, it is a solemnity. You should, it, it would be inappropriate for you to fast on a solemnity, right? Because you should be feasting. Makes sense. Right, so anyway, I just want to make that correction. What a pity. I know, I know. But you know, we've had a pretty good run i mean we've had this is the this second correction we've second, had to make second correction in Both four of years were my fault <laughs> shocker um i think it's everybody, coinc- i think it's just coincidence i think everybody would have thought that it would have been me uh but, but both times it's been him right correct uh-huh. yes uh but in four years almost five years two corrections that's it's not bad that's not all. too bad when you get behind a mic yeah but there's two just, two in the last year yes two in the last six months um, <laughs> Maybe it's a bad sign. <laughs> when you get behind a mic, there's just going to be a time. 
if you if you're behind it long enough that you're going to say something that you need you need to clarify or make a correction on that's Look, just material human nature material heresy is inevitable okay the main <laughs> thing to avoid is formal heresy okay you just well you you want to avoid both sure I, you I, you do your best you, but you, you know material heresy it sneaks up on you that's the thing about it. That's it's sneaky. Importance of a well-formed conscience. Right. Okay. But anyway. Well, let's try to get through tonight without, without anything. Without it. Like yes. That. You know yes. what? Yes. That's a good By that's God's a good plan. grace. By God's grace. Okay. So. Um, Can we just talk about this really quick? Okay. Sure. Um, Why don't you do this? Okay. So we're having the Lefroy Caridas. Is that it? Is it the Caridas? No, yeah. no, no, yeah, no, no. Yeah. Oh, it is. Yeah. Okay. It's the port and wine casks. Mm -hmm. This is incredible. It's it is. incredible. It looks kind of like a like a rosé wine or like a pink champagne. Mm -hmm. The color is very interesting because uh, from the wine. important wine. Yeah. It is very interesting. Uh, okay, so we, we call it, we said Caridas. There's a lot of people, because it's, it's gay, like they, they pronounce it a bunch of different ways, George. And uh, But what it means is friendship in Gaelic. Uh, so it's very appropriate for this show. It's the one bottle that they release a year that's a little different, that they kind of tweak and they change it. They make it a little you know unique for the year and this this year was the they took their scotch and aged it in port and wine casks and it gives it a very sweet you know lafroig is known for their peat there it's known for their it's very strong peat iodine smoky it's pow in your face you got to be a man of, to drink it type of uh scotch but when you age it in this port and wine it's going to give it a little bit of a sweetness to it, a little bit of raisin taste to it. It's going to give it a little bit more uh, mellow than what you're used to of the peat, the strong peat. Um, so anyway, I, I do, I thoroughly enjoy it. I just it's really not, like it. It's I not really what like it. I expect. How much was I, it? A hundred dollars. I mean, it, the carry Doss is, or it's typically car, about car, car, car chase. Yeah. I know. Car chase. Is that what it was? Car chase. Mm -hmm. That's, I was trying to remember like, what was something about cars? Mm -hmm. Car chase. Mm -hmm. uh, whatever. I still, my still, I stand firm that the Gaelic don't know how to spell or read. It's either one of, one of the two, and I know they go hand in hand, but like. You know, I, I, I was telling you guys earlier, I haven't really drank alcohol in like 10 years now, but I would really like to smell it. Absolutely. Do it. Just have a little smell. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, because it just smells, it's very, it's a very unique smell. It's very interesting. I smell raisins. Yeah, exactly. It's very nice. Yeah, it's exactly. Very nice. Um, okay, so that's what we're drinking this evening. We're just going to sip on this. We're not going to have any... I just wanted to mention it. Because yeah, if it I was agree. It wasn't so good, we would have just gone by, but this one it really worth, is... Uh, I'm happy that you guys like it so much. Yeah, it's worth, it's worth the time to, to spend. If you're going to do it, that's do it good. well. That's so, good. But this evening, we're not going to have any breaks because the, the, our guest this, this evening is, is, is worth just having a good, solid conversation. Right, with, right. A friendly conversation. We're drinking, we're drinking the... Uh, Carches uh, Lefroig. So, uh, the guys who've been on the Catholic Man Show campout will know George as the uh, blacksmith that's helped us with a, uh, pound a bunch of uh, molten metal. Yeah, that um, was just a blast. And so he's the one. This, so that, at our campout, we had a, a forge set up the whole time. George, you you were there. Oh, I don't know lot. how you were there a lot. Mm -hmm. Which I was always so glad when you were because there were times when I'd be there by myself. Just like beating the crap out of this metal, like I don't know what I'm doing. In fact, right. it's it's getting worse. You're it's okay. getting well. There was definitely a point where I was regressing, you know. And then you showed up, and then it's like, okay, good. good. It's never that bad. No, you know, it's not as bad as you think when you're doing it. Well, it's... I was trying to draw out a point, uh, you know, for this. So I was making a knife for the, you know, for the. For our from listeners, I was trying to make a knife, and the handle portion from of the a railroad knife, spike from a yes, from a railroad spike, um, and so the the handle portion I was trying to draw into a like a tiny point and then curl to make a loop, and that was going to go down into the handle, and that loop I was going to try to drive a, a tack through, so it would hold firm, but I kept drawing out into a point, and then I'd pull it out of the coal, and it would be gone. It's just gone. It's very common. Yeah. yeah, you have to watch yourself. I think those railroad spikes though were not regular size railroad spikes. I think they were like they the were, mine car. Yeah, they were old, they, very old. Yeah, they looked very old. Yeah, they were from like, <laughs> almost like those mine car sp uh, railroad spikes. Potentially, yeah. They were I think not... they were iron versus uh, steel. I mm -hmm. don't think they had any steel in them. Okay. Okay, so 
So I, we want to get to your background and, and everything, George, but just to let people know, why don't you give them just a little taste of what what you just accomplished at Clear Creek Abbey, uh, the guys who, who uh, and, have been... And before you answer out. this question, I just want to throw, like, mention this. We, we do have images of some of the stuff, that mm. the work that, that Mr. Carpenter has just completed. So um, if, if it's an option, this would be a great episode to watch on YouTube. We're going to do our best to describe, you know, the work, the, the carvings that you've done. Um, the reliefs that you've just completed, but you, we I, we are just not going to be able to do it justice right. uh, with our words. So really, if you can, hop on over to YouTube and you can watch watch the yeah. episode. I think that'd be a good thing to do. I think one thing that throws a lot of people off is the fact that for the last seven years, I've been carving stone to where uh, I'm trained as a blacksmith. So like, how you made that transition, mm -hmm. you know, and. Uh, and I'll, I'll tell you exactly how it happened. Um, one, um, one day I was uh, in a, a meeting with the abbot, um, uh, Philip Anderson, at Clear Creek Monastery. And uh, I had been doing work, uh, blacksmith work, forge work for the monastery for some years at, at that point. And he said, uh, well, you know, there's only so much metal that can go into a monastery. And he said, but if you could carve stone, I could keep you busy for quite some time. And uh, so that day I went down to the blacksmith shop and started forging the, the stone working tools. And um, I had done a little stone carving before in the past. So I'm originally from Indiana and uh, my uh, father he's from uh, bloomington indiana which is known for the uh, limestone uh indiana limestone yeah this uh, bedford bloomington area and uh he when i was younger he had actually gotten me a, a piece uh, of limestone and and he said hey i thought you might want to play around with this and i started carving it with like uh i was like concrete nails and just trying to shape it and yeah. maybe some wood chisels so this was probably in my early 20s and uh but you know do you still have it did you like did it did it, I, it did it become a, 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 did it, it become anything gift. yeah i gave it to someone okay you know, yeah it was a gift so what you what did you carve it was a celtic um this is like a celtic uh, knot work pattern oh cool and it was uh used in a uh, as a foundation stone in a in a log cabin really northern minnesota oh sweet so so uh but the last seven years has been this uh uh sculpture that's above the doorway at the monastery church it's called a tympanum just i always think of uh a tympanum drum okay yeah. if you think yeah. of the drum but you turn it upside down uh-huh and um uh, so historically in um, Romanesque churches, so we're talking uh, uh, 11th, 12th century, mm -hmm. that tympanum would be carved with different scenes. So you would have sometimes uh, Christ, uh, a, ju a judgment scene. Uh, some, you would see the the damned on one side and the saved on the other. Right. And then, um, and then there, there were other, there are multiple. Like maybe the damned scenes. below his feet. Yes. Is that typically? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and you would usually always see the four gospels, the mm -hmm. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but not all the time. There were many tympanums carved. So you would see it in Roman times too, but just a totally different theme. And not many tympanums. So I think it was uh, 10, uh, 90s when the first Christian tympanum came out in, in architecture okay. for, the, for churches. 1090? Roughly. Ish. Yeah, yeah, sure. Ish. Uh, so, I'm so, sure the so historians can, can yeah, you know, right, right. Uh, write in and they, correct me if they, they need they love to. to. They love doing things like that. So, okay, so <laughs> F F Father Abbott approaches you. You've been doing the blacksmith's work for the, for the Abbey. He says, like, if you can do limestone carvings i can keep you busy you hadn't you've not been professionally trained in carving no. limestone at all but you've done a little bit from 
your dad, you know, giving you a limestone block, oh, and no. you kind of pl- tinkered around so with it. So you had, like, one little thing that you had done years ago. So where do you start? Right, what right. You, what okay. do you do? So, yeah, so was this the, the thing- first thing that you did, or did you... You must have practiced on. Well, no, yeah. Yeah, you don't just move on. They, I mean, he's not going to throw you on a tympanum, right? Right. right. So uh, what I started to do was after I made the tools, and then that went through a whole series of trying to figure out exactly, you know, do your research, figure out exactly what stone carvers use. And then um, I started finding uh, uh, local stone. There was some stone from a quarry that's now uh, no longer used in, in Tulsa that was a limestone. And I started, it was uh, used in the bridge going to the monastery. Hmm. And there were leftover pieces. So I took those pieces and I just started doing little sample pieces based off of Romanesque uh, uh, designs and um, would try to get the feel of what they were doing. So, and we're talking about stones, you know. Yay, big, you know, maybe what, uh, even 12 by 12, 12 by or 12, something sure. like along those lines. And then I would just, once I would carve one, I would just ship it their way and then just say, hey, it's just something to talk about. Let's, you know, and, uh, and little by little, they said, hey, well, let's start a little project. You know, let's get something started. So um, we started carving the, the altars that are down in the uh, crypt of the monastery church. And, uh, so once that, uh, once we started to get s- certain uh, a level of success, then you know the projects kept coming and, and get, getting and, bigger and right. bigger and bigger. Yeah, because it's not like you can like open up the yellow pages under sculptors and just you know find a list of of people. I mean, how how do you how many other sculptors now that you're us one? How many do you know? There's a lot. There's a lot. Of Are there really? Yeah, and they're always really busy. There, I mean, there's a lot of things going on. Okay, they're doing work. I don't know any except for yeah, you. N- you know, no, and um, I don't know a lot. But the, online, you see that they're out there and they're carving stone. Sure. And, uh, they're, you know, especially after the um, uh, the late 1960s, there's has been a huge craft revival in the United States and also around the world. But and then as the generations, you know, as time goes by, that just keeps increasing, and increasing, especially even with the with, of course, just like anything else, when the Web kicked in. Now you could really start to identify where these people are. And, you know, when I w- uh, was like I graduated from high school in 91, uh, it was all my guidance ca- counselor could do to find something that was a trade oriented that I could do, you know, uh, where I could, because I was working with my hands in high school. I don't, did you guys have, uh, like, uh, no a wood shop no. or no. anything like that? I wish we did. No. So like, uh, the industrial arts program was still, I mean, are you kidding? Do you like, that is just a lawsuit. So it's just like begging for a lawsuit. Like, I don't know how they got through it, how they did. Well, it, the but. culture used to be, I mean, if you got hurt, I mean, my dad has stories about people losing, a, like the, like a little piece of your Another. finger. Yeah, yeah. Like, we're getting hurt <laughs> yeah. in woodshop class. I mean, I think that was like something that just kind of happened every now and then. And you knew it was- you just knew that, like, well, you know, their parents said, "Well, Johnny, you shouldn't have done that." You, you know, yeah, maybe, these yeah. days you'd just sue the pants off the school. Yeah, it's unfortunate. Yeah, I know. Yeah. There used to be more just a sense of self-responsibility that it just doesn't exist anymore but anyway you just can't have wood shop class today yeah it's unfortunate well even at that time uh so i was doing uh you know at 16 i was playing guitar mm-hmm. a lot you yeah know? and i started making guitars and um in in wood shop and it was great the uh the uh, teacher was very supportive and um uh, but, for, you know, and then, like I, I mentioned in Minnesota was this, this stone piece that I went there. I, I actually went to out of high school. So I was probably 19, 20 years old. I went to a log cabin uh, workshop in northern Minnesota. Mm-hmm. And uh, I originally thought out of high school that's what I would get, get into. It was like the log cabin um, uh, business, uh, building log homes. So, uh, but I've always been like, 
well, not as much now, but when I was younger, I was just kind of a library nerd. So I would just go to the library and just try to find everything I could on any uh, given the building of things. Mm -hmm. And I um, picked up uh, a couple of books on f f Frank Lloyd Wright. And uh, well, you know, the, this concept of designing furniture and the the door hardware for the homes that he would build i thought that was just absolutely fascinating that architects used to do a lot of that to where they were designing lighting fixtures and site-specific furniture for that home so i thought with the log cabins you need iron door hardware right yeah, hinges sure. and right. things like this so uh, i went back in Back at that time, I don't know if they even have traders anymore. We called it a trader. It was just a magazine that you could just find tools. Uh, mm. You know, it's kind of a, like a Craigslist of today, but mm -hmm. it was a newspaper. And they had, um, I found a guy that had a small blacksmithing uh, setup, a forge and a anvil, and I went and bought it. And then once some friends of mine knew that I was interested in that, in, in this type of work they introduced me to a man his name was doc well, we call him doc pease and doc pease worked for a historical museum so i was um you know 20 21 years old maybe and he introduced me to this historical museum it was called connor prairie it was kind of like indiana's equivalent to like a colonial williamsburg okay uh, if you if you guys are familiar with that so it was set the the interesting thing they had a modern shop but they also had uh, this old town village that was set in the year 1836 so in uh versus like colonial williamsburg if you go there the uh it's set up like this is how they would they, the way they interpret their work was like this is how they would have done this but in at connor prairie it was andrew jackson was president <laughs> and oh, okay. uh, sure. you, I, you had your own persona. My name was Reuben Pruitt. Nice. And, uh, I like it. So Good I trained. Name. I trained in the historic blacksmith shop. So all the equipment in this historic blacksmith shop was of the period of the early, early 19th century. Okay. So 1836. Alamo was 1836. Okay. Uh, it was right before the, the American industrial revolution kicked in to where if you needed um garden tools if you needed um we turn those on auto hinges of some sort you would uh yeah you would go to a local blacksmith so that was kind of my initial training in forge work i mean blacksmith is black blacksmiths used to be incredibly busy because you wouldn't buy you wouldn't go to the store i mean now today if you need hinges you go to the store and you buy hinges you know, you couldn't just go buy stuff like that. I, I assume you had to ha go have it made. Yeah, especially before 1840. Right. You know, and there was a lot of iron work that was coming from Europe too. You could, I mean, from England, uh, during, especially during the uh, before the Revolutionary, or, right? Uh, yeah, the Revolutionary War, but. Um, that was a, just a great training. The, the, the thing that was great about Connor Prairie was the, the the other craftsmen that worked there. It was just a, it was incredible, incredible to be around these men that uh, were very, uh, just extreme, uh, extremely talented in uh, woodworking, metalworking. They had a potter shop. It's it was they they were doing phenomenal work. So as being a younger guy, being around men that were doing this, this was very fundamental uh, um, uh, in my development uh, to have some somebody that was very sure. responsive to that beginning training. And I imagine doing it the old school way really uh, reinforces you in the fundamentals of absolutely. You know, because the new school stuff, you're going to be able to kind of cheat typically. I don't know because I'm not doing it, but I'm just like kind of applying general principles to old school versus new school. Old school stuff, you had to have like it's all about basics and fundamentals of whatever the task is you're doing. Was that the case with blacksmith? I always think that the the word cheat 
when you said cheat, I, it's, uh, I think one thing for me, what a lot of times in these kinds of debate on what is cheating, I always say, was electricity used or not? So was, but what i mean even from lighting down yeah. to a dr uh, to a hand drill versus a, a you know a, a see i think a power a, hammer is cheating in the blacksmith world like when it comes to you know being a blacksmith you got a power hammer if, if i'm in the commercial blacksmith industry you better believe i'm gonna have a power hammer like if i can afford one uh but when it comes to just to like the craft so here's it's another one cheating. for the historians to figure out. So the oldest blacksmith shop that I know of in, in the world is in France. And it's, it's at a monastery called Fontenay. And the forge is still in existence. It's a huge building. Mm -hmm. And it's off of the, off of the, uh, the main uh, cloister. And they actually had a water-powered hammer that was there that would run off a... Uh, a shaft that would lift up a huge hammer. This is, uh, I mean, it was uh, Bernard of, Cl it was a Cistercian. So it wow. was Bernard of so was Clairvaux. So was it gravity? It was like, yes. Like the, the water yeah. would lift it and then it would just drop. That's right. Okay. So when you say power hammer cheating, you know, a lot of people mm. will even say, is, well, yeah, okay. well, I mean, they were using a mechanical hammer in order to forge steel or, or iron at that point. And, um, uh, so, and then that uh, just throughout time it just kept being developed more and more that that we what we have today. You know, even through right. the uh, uh, the Civil War, you had the drop hammers that would forge the bodies for you know different firearms, and mm -hmm. so the technological uh, developments just it's always been there. That's why I say was, was, is it electricity being used? So I bought, I brought one example. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So if you can see this, this is a lock that a good friend of mine, his name's Tom Tolson down in Fort Worth, Texas found as his name a, is Tom Tulsa, Tom Tolson, Tolson, Tolson. Oh, so he is a Tolson. Yeah. Okay. Not, not from Tulsa. Tulsa. Right. He's just being <laughs> David. So Tom found this at a uh, flea market, and it's a, a historic Can I see lock. It? Yeah, sure. It's a lock. So it's a lock. It's a. It's what, what I've always called a trunk. It's a trunk lock. So this would fit down into a trunk, mm -hmm. and, oh. uh, but the thing that's very interesting about this piece, everything on it the sheet metal that's used is all forged and forged and uh the way it's riveted together the whole piece is riveted that's very cool i think it's awesome that it's even ornamental on the inside like yeah so like that's, the when i saw this right here i thought wait they i thought this was the outside but this is so decorative but that's just well, the they, inside they say, of the inside of the, the trunk this is where the key goes so right? th yeah so th the way that I believe this is set up. You would think that this would be a piece of wood that, so this fits on the inside, right? Right. So your key goes through the wood into this opening. Mm -hmm. And then these are called the wards. These, I don't have my glasses on. You see? Yeah, 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 yeah. So the key has to fit through the wards. And then turn and it. And then what it does is it opens up these, you see how it's opening up down here? And uh -huh. this huge spring here, the C spring. Oh, that's a big spring. Is holding this all together, right? So these open up and then the, the, the Look lid. Look at that. Will come it can up, open. Right? Nice. So what, so this chiseling that you see here is very, uh, for me is very German. It's probably a, a German, uh, maybe 16th century. 17th century uh -huh. but the one, one thing that I, i've always thought that was very fascinating about it is it, it looks i can can you see if you if you just have it on a table it just looks like a really odd piece of sculpture uh -huh. i don't know that if you just gave it to me i don't know that i would have no, been able to guess was. what it was yeah tom when tom brought it to me he said uh 
I, he said, I knew you would know what it was. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> did he know he, what it was? Yeah. I think he knew it was a lock. Uh -huh. He knew it was a lock, but uh, you know, uh, fortunately I, I, at the time I was reading a, a book called his uh, antique French iron. Oh yeah. I've read that one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's a classic. Yeah. It, uh, hey, it's a real page turner. <laughs> it's funny. It's rarely I see it, <laughs> but I was, I was at uh, this, uh, Two weeks ago, I was at the NSU library and they have it. And I, oh, really? Yeah, I picked it up and turned to the page that have has locks like this. So they, they wow. date locks by the, the shape of the gill. Okay. Okay. Right. So at Connor Prairie, this is a lot. This was, I mean, we, we did several types of work, but the, the, the one that uh, I really was fond of was what they would call hi historical reproductions. So where we would take something like a lock or different, uh, even even a, a hook, you know, something you would, and and reproduce it. And uh, and when you say reproduce it, you mean the exact same way that they would have had to have made it. Is it that was, correct? It was critiqued. Okay. If it did not look like the original piece, it was rejected. Are you were you, are you allowed to use power tools at that time? Maybe we tried to do most of the time. We tried to do it all in the old shop. The way so, the way they would have yeah, done it. The way sure. they would have done it. Okay. So the, yeah, and that would be how. So it would have taken some force to turn this key because this would have been a, a big key. Yeah, because yeah. like the spring on here is it, is stout. pretty stout. Yeah. And I'm I'm impressed that it still functions, you know, on a basic level. Yeah, it, it, it's not rusted shut, you know, and. No, it's that's nice. It's pretty in good cool. shape. Okay, so you are what I would call a craftsman. You know, you are a blacksmith, but really, I think what you are, what you're like, what is the nature? He's a carpenter as well. What's, what is George Carpenter's nature? I would say you're a craftsman. I, I would say I've always kind of referred my to myself as a craftsman, mm -hmm. and then later on, it became artisan. Yeah, you know, mm -hmm. sure. But even uh, th then, when you start to use that, people say artesian, like a artesian well, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, craftsman, I, 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 I think it was very appropriate. The, the, the other thing that with me, so in the town that I lived in was right next to this town in Indiana. Um, my hometown was called Edinburgh, Indiana, and it was just north of this town called Columbus. And Columbus is, uh, has this huge, like 70 different buildings that were all uh, from modern architects. Okay. And, but it's a small town. It's, it's, it's a fairly, I think that even now is like maybe 40,000 maybe. Oh, wow. And, uh, but uh, like, do you know, like the, the, the Louvre, uh, the, the pyramid that was very controversial right. when it was mm -hmm. built? Mm-hmm. So the architect of that was I.M. Pei. Well, I.M. Pei designed the, the library in Columbus that I used to go to. Hmm. So I was around modern architecture all the time as a kid. I fell in love with it, but not from the standpoint of like even the, the contrast between old and new. I liked them both all the time. But I think that living near Columbus had a big influence on me for my love for architecture. But getting back to this question about craftsmen or artists, where do you, where did I fit in? Where, what really hit me was, I think it was April of uh, 1999, um, St. John Paul II wrote mm -hmm. the letter to artists. Oh. And when I read that, that really hit me. That uh, most of the work that I was doing before that time was for different, uh, indiv you know, uh, when, once I got out of the museum world, I was doing work for, uh, just, uh, clients, patrons in the civilian world, mm -hmm. just kind of contract work and things contract like that. Contract work. Sure. Uh, mostly, uh, forged metal work. But then, uh, that letter to artists really meant a lot to me that how do you start to use your craft? towards working for the church yeah so uh, and at, at the same time so i was living in uh, where i met my wife in uh in texas i was living in fort worth texas at the time 
and um, uh, we were started to go to the uh, to the Latin Mass in mm -hmm. Texas. Mm -hmm. So uh, Mother Day. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, in Fort Worth. Mm -hmm. And uh, Adam, I award you three points. Thank you. It was unexpected that you would just know. I assume there's more than one Latin Mass in Texas, so there is. Yeah. I, at the time, I don't know if there was, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> you I, might be I, right. It, it's kind of like stone carvers. It's right. out there. You you just have to know where to look. You right. Know? Mm -hmm. So uh, like a, a liturgy artisan. Well, uh, a liturgy. Uh, uh, Don't think about it too much, George. <laughs> yeah, they call it liturgical art. Sure. You know, okay. Yeah. Liturgical art. Yeah. art. So, um, so here you are, you know, working in Clear Creek, and you're doing all this iron work, and you start working on the temp timpani. Timpanum. Timpanum. let's talk about that and uh like how is it that you decided what it was going to look like uh, obviously I'm, I'm assuming you were, worked with father abbott you know mm -hmm. to decide those kinds of things um what was the process like starting from a big piece of rock mm -hmm. to arriving at what's on the screen like what's on the screen that right we now. can see so i don't know if we talked about I'm sure we have the times that you've been up there before on the scaffolding that the 12 apostles that you see down below. So here's the somebody thing. else. His name is Andrew Wilson Smith, mm -hmm. and he's the son of Thomas Gordon Smith, who was the architect that designed the, the monastery. Fun fact, he's also a cousin of a, a Dominican priest. That's right. In the in Europe, I believe. I think Brother Innocent. Yes. Or Father, Father Innocent. Innocent. Yeah, 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 Father yeah, Innocent. Yep, yep. Of course. Do I get three more points? Mm, I'll give you one point. All right, I'll take yeah. it. It's very good. Yeah. You very still good. have infinitely more points than anybody else on this episode. I'll take it. He's actually, uh, I believe, his kind of a scoundrel. Likeness, oh, sorry. <laughs> I believe his likeness is actually in the the one of the apostles there. Oh, oh really? I know that his father is Thomas uh, Gordon Smith, who uh, is uh, Saint Thomas is mm -hmm. the 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 patron saint of architects. So he used his father's likeness for St. Thomas for, for St. Oh, Thomas. That's awesome. And, and, and he uh, is St. Thomas is the patron saint of architects. Yes. I didn't know that. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So this was a, like, like we mentioned, it's a seven, it was a seven year project. We'll from see. The thing is, is for, uh, originally, I think it was, a. I think we came, we, uh, when Andrew was here, um, two weeks ago when it was unveiled, we, we were stumbling around trying to figure out when it actually started. So originally, Andrew was commissioned to make the two capitals that are on top of the columns that you you can barely see in this in this image here. But the uh, so the two capitals there you, you see on the yep. co sure. columns. So so what, wait, what are the capitals? Is that the the rounded? Right after the rounded column, right at the the, the top of the oh of that. oh okay so, like the so the, the, the support for yes. the. Right, immediately below the apostles. Yes. Okay. Yes. So originally he was he was involved in the design of those capitals, and above that was something all. It was totally different. It was going to. I I don't know exactly what it was going to be, but I think it was going to be like a a herringbone, like a brick pattern. Okay. So so the only artwork that you would see were those two capitals. And just through a series of discussions, we, uh, Father Abbott had mentioned to Thomas Gordon Smith about doing a design for an actual tympanum carving, uh, a larger yeah. piece. So uh, Andrew and I went through and started doing a series of drawings on what this could be. So kind of getting back to your question of yeah. like, how do you start to do this? It always starts with drawings. So we started doing a series of drawings and, um, and at a certain point, uh, father Abbott came to the determination that he wanted, uh, Andrew to do because of the, of the size of the figures on the Capitol that he thought it would be appropriate for him to do the lentil, the 12 apostles. 
and then the, I would do the the piece that was above that, and then uh, Andrew went to. Um, are you familiar with um, uh, Gregory the Great Academy mm -hmm. in, yeah. in, mm -hmm. in Pennsylvania? Yeah. So he went there to to do the the refounding of the. It was Saint Saint Greg's, and now it's Gregory the Great. He was one of the founders for that, and. Um, so after the time when he finished the uh, lintel then then he left and then i started to do so th the carving of the uh, the tympanum above the lintel that was the seven years that i was working on that okay wow. and six 55 gallon drums of stone came off of that uh the part that i had done so is it a se is the the lintel a separate rock from the tympanum so it's comprised of above the capitals, the the lintel up is comprised of four separate stones, and those stones came from northeast of Little Rock, Arkansas, in a town called Batesville, Batesville, Arkansas, and it's this stone is class it's um, it meets one of the classifications as a marble, so it it can be polished. Okay, and um, so. And, so, and and it was important that you find the right kind of stone. And it it took a, quite a, a bit of investigation to figure out because there's a lot of there's actually a lot of quarries around the mo the monastery was looking trying to find something that was local a, a local as as in like Kansas, uh, Arkansas, Missouri, Texas, and and sure. and even in Oklahoma, there's several quarries in uh, Oklahoma that. Mm -hmm. You know, so but then you had to get into specifics about like what size stone could you actually bring out of the ground, and then can it be? Uh, does it have? Uh, what is it comprised of? Uh, you know, there's of course there's a lot of sandstone here, and mm -hmm, there's right. a lot of there is limestone, but it also has a lot of quartz in it, which is like glass when you're carving it. Hard to carve. Uh, it shatters like glass oh, okay you know when you hit it so it's not yeah so you can't just easily it can be carved but it it's the, to get for me from my experience to get real fine detail it's it's hard to you know pull off okay that we, what i was what we were right. shooting for and you also need something that's, that's going to wear well yes. or not or not no. at all oh i mean it depends on what you mean by well. well right yeah, exactly. Means I mean, not at all in a statue, in statue terms. So, we're about, should, it's not gonna, so should I tell the story of how we determined whether it was going to wear? Yes, I don't yes. know. I don't know the yeah. story. So I mentioned earlier that uh, my father being from Bloomington, uh, I, by the way, hi, dad, mom. Look, I made it. <laughs> 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 so, uh, well, the architect, so uh, there's there's so many buildings in the United States that it's made out of Indiana limestone. And uh, so the Washington Cathedral, St. John's of the Vine, so many different buildings through, I mean, I could just, you could just name um, hundreds if not thousands of buildings that are made out of Indiana limestone. I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of the, um, the Art Deco work here in Tulsa was, it was India, the, the uh, we talked about Christ the King yeah. The stone there looks like Indiana limestone. It's it's very uh, it's easy to carve. You can get huge pieces of uh, out of the quarries there. Did you guys ever see the movie? Uh, I think it was called uh, Breaking Away. It was about a. Uh, I'm not. It was all no. filmed in Bloomington, and the quarries really played a big part. Breaking Away, I believe that's it. Anyhow, um, you can get uh, at least. Uh, 11 foot tall pieces of stone out of Indiana to where in Batesville you there you could only, there was a roughly about four foot tall so um, but a lot of the statuary that was made out of Indiana limestone in certain areas of the country that uh, depending on the way the 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 detail work uh, the weather took a toll on it and it would start to lose detail and so we were this is something that the uh andrew and uh and thomas had a little bit more knowledge in than me that could make that judgment call okay but they basically were, were saying hey we need to find a stone that's going to really hold up 
over over the years. Mm -hmm. So when we went to Batesville, Andrew and I went to Batesville, Arkansas, to to see the quarry, to talk to the quarry master, to find out if they could pull the stone the stone out that we needed. And then at the very end of the uh, the meeting, we asked them if there were any sculptures in Batesville that were over a hundred years old that we could we could view. So they said, yeah, we, we could take you to uh, some sculpture. So we went and it was in downtown Batesville. They took us to this Confederate war monument. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and it was over a hundred years old. I mean, they, uh, yeah, they said yeah. it was over a hundred years old and it looked like it had just been carved. And that really kind of determined. Oh, great. It was yeah. like, this is a we'll good do that stone. one. Yeah. 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 Because you don't want the last thing you want to do is invest all this time. And then in your lifetime, it watch away. it wear away. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you get, you get these four pieces of rock, you put them next to each other and you're able to make them look like one piece of rock somehow. I don't know how you do that, but it was difficult. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Here, here's what I love about it. So one, if you go back to the picture really quick, if you look, so we were able to see this when we were up on the scaffolding, when we were talking with George, but like the knees of, of our Lord is basically where the, the, the furthest out of the limestone, right? So if you actually look at it, the knees of the Lord is the furthest out. And then you get like, uh, the horns, uh, of the, of the oxen, um, is, is also kind Saint, of, yeah. St. Luke there in the bottom, right? Yeah. It is kind of flush with the knees of the Lord or pretty close to the knees of the Lord. So if you think about it, that's where he started. And then he worked his way back, which is just phenomenal, which is what you said. Like there are six fifty-five dick gallon drums of this rock that is pulling, pulling down. That's right. Um, and, and one of the things that I, that I really look up to you, George, like just because in, in today's world, the modern man is 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 going blind in in a in a sense of like they're not being able to see what reality really is, mm. right? So and they're not able to see the detail of of what something could be, and the craftsmanship that it takes to do something like this. When we were up there, you were even showing me that every spot is sloped angle is angled just a little bit, mm -hmm. so that way when the water hits it's rolling off and it's not going to pool like water pool, uh, you know, in mm -hmm. certain spots where it could deteriorate right. the, the, the stone and on top like of that. a wing or, right. or something. Right. right. And so there's so much, or that, even in Jesus's crown, you know, right. The Jesus is the That's top right. of Jesus. It's like a head. gutter system. Uh, it's like a gutter system. Yeah. Where you're always winning watershed. So, so like that is not water. something that, uh, like modern man, I like in my limited opinion, like thinks about, or can 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 contextualize and like look at this and say like okay this is what needs to happen with all of this and and uh, have the virtue of foresight uh, to be able to see this is what we need to do to achieve what, what we're and going. I didn't know it either I didn't know this is where like Thomas Gordon Smith really came into it I mean he was the you know in in discussions with him this was something that he specified that this has to be done this way. And that this is the way that good sculpture is done, and uh, and and also through Andrew, and they they were both very knowledgeable about how this stuff should be done. So I just, you know, just took the. It makes sense, you know. You right. don't want water pulling, so you right. got to get rid of the water. Right. So, it, well, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Dave. Will you just tell us about about this, like? You know, you had these discussions with Father Abbott. What was it that you guys were going for? And like, what was the significance behind the symbolism, you know, in, in, in this relief? So initially in the drawings, we, we, would sh we were talking to Father Abbott about different, um, we would talk about his historic precedent. So we were showing him actual examples uh, which he already knew of the great sure. sculptures that were in France. At the, at this right. Time I mean, he, he went to Funkumbo, yeah, you know, yeah. and I mean, he, I'm sure he's seen right. many, many of the just beautiful classic uh, works of art there, right. there in Europe, all throughout Europe. Right. Yeah. So, but it was just trying to uh, kind of pinpoint and kind of hone in where, which direction, what direction that we were going to go with. So, um, 
the uh, was in the one uh, tympanum that I was very fond of was a, was a, at the uh, monastery of Vesley. And, and at Vesley, it's the, the way it's set up is totally different than the way we set it up. I think it's more of the, uh, it's, it's Christ sending out the apostles to, to, to preach to the world. And that was the basic theme that you see in the tympanum. And, uh, but at Sharp, the, what you see is a lot along the lines of what we have, but you see a number of, of monastery churches and cathedrals. You say France. Ed Chart? Okay. I was going to ask you about that one because so, that one is awesome. It's phenomenal. And, um, so the, the whole, uh, the iconography of Christ being in a, a mandola with the four evangelists is that Chart. Uh-huh. But there are many different Romanesque versions of this. Right. So, like when I was starting to do my initial drawings of what it would look like on the monastery church, like one of the things that I did was I drew all the animals naturally. So the lion looked like a lion, the eagle looked like an eagle. And uh, Father Abbott. Uh, he said, you really need to work on your medieval uh, styling. Uh, he <laughs> said, I don't want it to look like a zoo up there, you know. Uh -huh. and, uh, so, you know, it's kind of a, you you start back at the drawing board and, and really try to look at, uh, for me, it was like looking at the, the like Mark, uh, the, the lion, the right. mane that's on lion, uh, uh, that's on Mark, uh, to try to find... Um, the historic examples of how how did in the 12th century did they depict a mane of a lion? So I always think that the medieval craftsmen, the um, they would definitely see an ox. They would know what an ox looked like for for modeling. They would know what an ox looked like, right? And maybe even like a, a, an eagle. They might even have an idea. But a lion, it might have been kind of tough for them to be able hmm. to figure out. Like if they didn't, I've really, never thought about that. Described that they them, might have never actually have seen, seen a lion, lion. right? And um, so uh, usually the lions in the from a, a medieval uh, uh, examples are in some ways kind of crude. You wouldn't, if you didn't know you were looking at a lion, you might not think that's a lion lion it's like a beast of some sort but um the uh, so I, you you've got to kind of think about it from that standpoint right also i think that there's something to be said that if it looked like a lion like kind of like what he's saying i don't want to look like a zoo up there then it's just a lion it looks like a lion there's nothing unusual about it but this is a divine lion you know, this isn't just a lion. We're talking about St. Mark, who... It's not a divine. Well, it's not a divine lion, but like a heavenly lion. You know, like, he's he's not a lion. He's, you know, depicted as a lion, but because of his, you know, divine forcefulness. You know what I mean? Like, not he's not God. I'm not saying he's God. Right. But, but there is, like, a, an aspect there of this heavenly reality of his lionness, you know. Do you guys know any marks? Yes. I know Mark. I know a mark. Yeah. You know no, a I, mark? I I think are you asking like people named Mark? Yes. I didn't you know, know if you meant like people who were like Mark was well, or you, Have you guys ever noticed that most guys that are named Mark, they're like lions though? Have you ever noticed this? Okay, you know what? The Mark that I do know, he is kind they're of... Very, they're very strong <laughs> like, guys. You like, know? Yeah. They're, I, uh, you know, they're powerful. I hate it. powerful. I, I used to play Ultimate Frisbee against him, and I hated when he was on the other team. <laughs> it's like, dang it. That guy is, is a beast. A big old beard. Think about Jesus' beard. I'm amazed. Oh, yeah. Let's talk about that really fast. Yeah, because we're already past... Uh, I think we're pro uh, approaching an hour on the podcast already. So... So, uh, Jesus yeah. is main. Uh, Jesus is main. Uh, I'm sorry. Jesus is I like beard. it. Hey, I, was I, li looking I like down, it. I was, I was looking down at, at, at Mark still. But so, Jesus' beard was very interesting because it, it, it has the scroll, scroll Romanesque 
the way the loot yeah, yeah, that yeah. they that they have they they did they did this and i think it, it, even from the drapery for me the way i interpret it the drapery the way that the hair was done was very uh, it was supernatural uh -huh. was supernatural and uh, the way that they would depict something supernatural and uh that's there that's it is a good, that's yeah, a good there we go now there you can see a little better yeah yeah so uh even the way that the, the hair is done in the back uh to this bring this is done this picture was taken before you right before, before you finish so the eyes are just not quite finished yeah. that's that's a drawing on the so if, if they don't look quite right that's why but yeah the, yeah those are pencil lines on the for the eyes yeah you know. And from this photo right here, you can, one thing that I like about this carving, which kind of, I think came uh, about like, I, I would say by divine intervention, is that if you look at the wings of the angel versus the wings of uh, St. John, the, the eagle on the other side of Christ, the angel's wings have detail. And if you were to get really up close, George, I have no idea how long it, you spent putting all those tiny 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 little lines on those wings for the angel but you can see the like the individual feathers on the angel which yeah, i thought I, was appropriate I, because the angel yeah. is of a higher nature than than yeah. saint john would have been yeah so, i did matthew first that's <laughs> and i was just like trying to get a sense of where i wanted to go yeah with things. yeah and then after i did uh john the eagle and then i the, his body is just filled with feathers that I was just like, how am I going to do all this? This is, you know, this is another just, year. This is another know, year. So I said, well, I'm just going to keep going and then just get the, the, the basic uh, uh, layout of where the feathers would be. And then uh, as I was going, I started to realize that I, personally, I liked it better without all the detail work on the feathers i i i liked it like the way it was and uh so what and this is where i would uh uh have father abbott i had him make the call i said do you want to me to finish out and fill out all the feathers on mark you know luke mm -hmm. and john and he said uh he saw it as a as a hierarchy you know and uh it was a distinction for the the uh the flying man right yeah and uh so we just kind of went with it you know mm -hmm. george let me ask you this what what did you learn from doing this what 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 takeaway did you have from like you know this has been a seven-year project for you this is something that it's not like also that you had a bunch of buddies that you were doing something like you didn't have a bunch of buddies building a log cabin this was a very almost like a solitary work that you were doing by yourself a lot a lot of times i mean you had inputs and you had father abbott come up there and give you insights but there was a lot of you had a lot of time by yourself working mm -hmm. by yourself for seven years mm -hmm. did it change you as a man like oh, absolutely, what, what, yeah. what like what 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 takeaways did you have from this i i think that um the the concept of trustful surrender you know, you have to kind of, to, to divine providence, you, you yeah. just have to <laughs> surrender to God because there, that, the, the, that whole notion of agony and the ecstasy, you know, that it is, is very arduous, a lot of that type of work, you know, not, not just having dust around you all the time, but just knowing where to start and where to go in. So we, we don't have time to go into this, but it's the method of how I carved it was, uh, there's, there's like different techniques that you can use to carve it. And the way that I carved it was with no modeling. So there was no, uh, like a full scale model that I could take dimensions off of. I basically just kind of, the way I kind of- You eyeballed what, it. I eyeballed it. I just said, I'm just going to kind of go for it. I kind of knew where the... George, the, that sounds like a terrible idea. <laughs> sounds this like is a terrible where, idea. This, <laughs> this is where that trustful surrender comes in. You know? <laughs> you, you, uh, you know, because there are many times where you lose the sense of even trusting yourself. It was like... Sure, trust, I can I, imagine. It was just like, I, I cannot do this. I'm over my head. I'm over my head. Yeah, I, I can I imagine. I don't know where to start. I was going to ask you that. Where was your first stroke? 
Uh, like where on the on the whole thing? There was a so up above the the figures are these these flowers. Mm -hmm. I thought I would start with those to just kind of get my feet wet. You right. Know, start with the do the, Jesus last. Yeah. Start with the rosettes. Yeah, that was a uh, that was a. Uh, that's where you. Uh, but that's where you started. So the thing was is that with and this is interesting. So with Jesus, like the the material, the, since that was the furthest material out uh -huh. uh, from everything else. Right. I he, I used him as a reference point. To, to get for dimensioning all the other figures. So Christ was the, the center f for everything else. Mm -hmm. So I h had to save him to the last because he, he was the only, once you start to remove the surface, you don't know where the, the uh, level is anymore. So Christ was the leveling point to base everything else off of. It's kind of hard to, to describe without drawing it. <laughs> mm -hmm. But uh, so did I answer your question? Yes. Yeah. 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 I mean, the so, flowers. I mean, so, so the flowers were the, were, first, were the first part. So, but for you, like, was there a, a spiritual, like, did it affect you? Like, I could, I can just imagine like going up there, like you were saying, like, sometimes you feel like you're over your head. Sometimes you feel like I, I'm making good progress. Sometimes you feel good about something sometimes you you can't like think about stone is once you take it off you can't really put it back on you know and so uh the the other thing in this seven year process right so towards probably even the like the last year when you go through the point of of surrender then there came this point and i, I would think that the closest thing that i can think of is like with uh, the, when in the sports where they say you're in the zone, mm -hmm. it's almost like you, you're 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 not even there. Yeah, you're you, just, you could you you're just could, going. You're just going. Yeah, it's almost like carved stone that. blind. You know, you could almost. I can get that. Yeah. So that's the other thing that was a development that I was just like, this is fascinating. It's all working and it's all coming together. So, but uh, that you know, uh, I'm glad that I achieved that you know got to that yeah. level and so uh um and that's what i people like a craftsman from all different uh places you know say like you know if you're even if you're playing the guitar or you're you know playing the piano or you're uh doing woodworking or you get to a, a point in in your craft where you don't have to really think about it anymore and you just kind of are you're just in the zone and you just you, you do right. it you just yeah. play the instrument you just work that that tool uh, uh, in woodworking you just kind of go i, I always think of the uh, the quote from uh, uh segovia the guitarist the classical guitarist segovia he said that uh if what i think it goes something along the lines of if i don't practice for one day i know if i don't practice for two days my my maid knows but if I don't practice for three days, everybody knows. So <laughs> you do have to stay in the game, mm -hmm. right? You, right. You know, uh, I think that's the big thing is you have to be uh, at whatever you're doing. Mm -hmm. So it, it goes with, with the, like you're saying, with everything else, whether you're cooking or music or any trade. You've right. got to be engaged in what you're doing. Or sports. And, uh, I mean, it doesn't matter. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It's, it's, Training, it's the same way. You know? Okay, this is my practice. last. This is my yeah. last question. Then I, I'll let you uh, book into this. Okay. Um, for for men out there in this day and age, it's very easy to say like, "Oh, my something is wrong in my house. I will just I I, I just call people for, to do that. I just call people to fix things. You know, I just uh, I'm not a guy who works with my hands very well, and so like it's just easier for me to call somebody to get to fix it for them sure, for, yeah. for me. I could really address this, right? So, uh, you know, what what do you say to those guys? I have my wife call. <laughs> <laughs> no, I should say this. My wife gets so fed up that she calls. You know, she just it's like I have a long list. Yeah. I can't get. But but in all, in, yeah, well, that's what they the, say. Like what, if you uh, if you want your clothes mended, don't marry a seamstress. Yeah, you know the the, right. the, the the cobbler's kids go barefoot. Right. Right. Yeah. You know, I right. Mean, right. There's there's a lot of different things like that. You know, 
And and there's uh, when it comes to certain trades, there's some things that I I mean electric. I'm I like anything with electricity. I'm just a, away from. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it could, you know, it's just not good. <laughs> I did that, and I've, I, I've just like for me, that's the other thing is like there's certain things you just have to give up on. I'm not going to get this, or I feel like you, yeah, you. There's some guys you focus that on other things that you're you good focus at. Focus on other things that you're good at, right? You yeah, know? but a lot of the guys I don't think have ever tried. You know, like yeah because there's a beauty by, by i guess my, my my real question was like there's a beauty and like there's a sense of pride of i think men are you know we're made to work with our hands sure, yeah. you know at the end of the day you, there's something tangible that you can say like i did this you know and in my world that i'm a sales guy i sit behind a desk a lot of times i'm in front of a computer mm -hmm. at the end of the day i don't have anything tangible i can't say like look honey i made this today mm -hmm. i have nothing tangible that I get to, uh, you know, showcase for what I, my work for the day. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I love, that's why I turned my garage into like a woodworking shop that like, I love working with my hand. That's why I love, you know, chopping wood with my sons, you know, and things like that, because it's like at the end of the day, even though it's exhausting, even though I may not be the best at it, even I may, I may make a lot of mistakes, but at the end of the day, I get to say like, look, here's something that I have done, you know, and like, there's a sense of uh, accomplishment in that. And I, and this this is one th where you're going with this to me this is where uh john paul ii's letter to the artist really it, he uh explains what's going on there you know and why we should work and mm -hmm. what in modern terms and he uses the creative right you're creative and you're, you're creating things and i think for me, and this is why I like with the with the the cookout. I think is so important is there are a lot of guys that maybe have seen blacksmithing work being done, but they would never they've never done it themselves. To at, one of the things, kind of getting back to what you were talking about earlier, Dave, uh, you kind of get lost in it though when you're forging that steel. You kind of get lost. There's something about it that's very it's 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 very exciting. Oh, it definitely it. is. Yes. And um, to have the opportunity, yeah, it's kind of it's addictive. Kind it's of. It's very very much yeah. so because you're taking this thing that uh, you wouldn't be able. To, you're shaping it mm -hmm. right, and you're you're being able to make uh, you know whatever comes to your mind that. Um, to have the opportunity to just to be able to, to to get your feet wet so to speak you know and just yeah. to be able to do it and that's f for me why everyone should that's interested should come to the you know the camp yeah, out yeah the know, camp out next year be able to yeah. do that so um so i i I, uh, I do have one more question i two more questions actually did you have a any panic moments where you said oh crap absolutely what was oh, your yeah. what was your worst one when and how did you fix it <laughs> uh, I I don't think it's more about fixing anything it's usually um, it, it, the, for me the answer is always there you know you that's kind of going back mm -hmm. to surrender the answer is there it's it's the prayer that I would pray a lot would be like you want you know god you want me here you want me doing this right you want me doing you've asked me to be here to do this mm -hmm. you but you're gonna have to show me the answer those are my favorite right? prayers like you put me here yeah, you, put <laughs> okay. me here. you put me here. you better fix this you know? <laughs> and uh and i think that th that's the thing is that's what that's what people are counting on father abbott's counting that i'm gonna fix figure out whatever the problem is mm -hmm. so i don't have to go to him he does well i never really talked to him about my issues you know sure he just and trusted that you would figure it out i would figure it out yeah. you know and uh and i think that's the thing is you just have to be persistent uh what uh, lewis and clark you know well we we woke up this morning and we proceeded forward right you just yeah. have to keep going forward and uh so you had times where you thought like oh i took off too much right there i i overdid it with the chisel no oh you didn't that's no, incredible think so. that's absolutely i mean like well, don't you think that's amazing seven years of work like you've never even really done this before really and 
you you didn't have any it's a slow process yeah yeah it's sure a slow process you know and it, so i think the thing is is that uh still i think that's amazing well i i don't know i don't know were there times that i i wanted something to be one way and i chiseled it off or chipped it off yeah that happened uh -huh. but that wasn't a panic moment for me i just said it's still there somewhere in there just gotta, to, to, to bring it out now i've got to match the other side or do this right you know? okay and then uh i try not to uh you know throw the piece of stone across the parking lot or anything you know <laughs> or drop <laughs> it on just, somebody <laughs> just stay cool it's it's there the answer's there you right, know? right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. there was it. one time that there was one area on this uh in this stone that I actually ran into this pocket. It was like a, a pocket that when I hit like it, porosity almost like a yeah, hole, like a, like a hole, a, yeah. uh, an air and, bubble. in it. Yeah. It was like an air bubble. And it was, uh, fortunately it was uh, like up underneath a leg of the, of Mark. Okay. There was just like a little hole and I hit it and it was just like all this brown stuff started coming out like le like a leaf material or something it was really oh. odd i wow. was hoping that maybe there would be like some uh, dinosaur you know whatever <laughs> i don't know but uh you know i patched it there was one time there was a part on the the piece that uh when when you're when i'm removing the negative space the mm -hmm. negative space uh, to find the depth of mm -hmm. how to car how far to carve back mm -hmm. Uh, especially on Mark, I went too far with the, with the core drill. So, and then, but when I saw it and I went so far and I said, well, I'll be able to carve the material back. I'll be able to carve his body back and, 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 uh, fix the problem. But once I got to an area where I said, well, no, his body looks good, but the hole is still there. Then I, I just filled it. I filled it with stone. So I had pieces of the stone left over. And I just mortared it in. You know? Okay. Yeah. So you mortared it in and sanded it down. Yeah. Okay. Because yeah. okay. there are ways to fix. There's ways to fix mess ups or problems like that. Uh -huh. And then, so for me, I don't go, oh man, I messed up this piece. Bring in I, some new rock. Take yeah, this rock out. This I got to start over. Effective. It's like, you've got to work around it. Right. Work sure. past it. So, yeah. So, okay. What I think, I think, in my opinion, what you've done is um, world class. Oh, thank you. I, I mean, I, I, I really do think that. And I've had other people agree with me on that. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, and a lot of people don't agree with Dave. So that's saying something. <laughs> there's a lot of people who are wrong in the world. <laughs> so are you available for hire? Like if somebody, if somebody had a, a job for you, are you uh, available? I mean, because I know you're still, you live close to the mon to the Abbey. I, I I think that you really love what you're doing, working for the Abbey. Mm -hmm. I mean, in that it is like your your job. Who who out there gets to do what you're doing? Leave something behind that will last for a thousand, two thousand, three thousand years. You know where your work. My work will not be around, you know. And nothing, nothing, won't be in the next nothing lifetime. that I do in my life will be here in a thousand years. Mm -hmm. Nothing. I'm okay with that, you know. I'm not. But would, but would, what you do is so special. Here, here's one thing to think about: Would you be okay with something that you were going to do that would be around for a thousand years, but in two hundred years, no one knew that you did it? Would you still be happy with that? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So, so, and I think that that's the thing is like the the sculptures in medieval, uh, the early medieval France. A lot of those pieces, no one knows who did those. Sure. Really, the maybe some of the architects and the and the abbots, their names were remembered, but the the artisans were forgotten. Yeah, mostly it was the people who paid for them. Like sometimes their names, the uh, the patron was often inscribed into the work of art, but very rarely was it the actual artist. Yeah. So I think for me, uh, that's where it becomes, it, it's, it's my own, it's my own private devotion. You know, it's, it's, I'm doing this for God. Uh -huh. Right. Right. 
So and I, that for me, I'm like, name shame. You know, I don't. It's, that's not right. It's not that's not important. But um, I. Um, but let's say okay. So here's here's an example. Um, at Saint Benedict's, you, my you, parish, I, we just had okay. two statues carved from out of Italian marble. We had them done in Italy, and they were sure. sent here. Like, let's say somebody is working on a, a project for their church. They want to have a statue carved. Could they send the rock to you? Like, are you uh, like, are you available for hire in some fashion, or are are you it's still very, are you fully employed? Yeah. So you're just and not. The monastery has a tremendous amount of work. Sure. And I'm very pleased with that, and <laughs> yeah, no, sure wouldn't. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm very, thing. I'm really, really engaged in what what's going on there. Yeah. But if there's special job, if there's certain jobs, like I, I did some work for. Um, uh, is it um, in Miami? Uh, Sacred Heart. Sacred Heart, but it was more. Uh, Their reliquary consulting. there is incredible. They have an awesome reliquary, at Sacred Heart in Miami. You wouldn't think small town, middle of nowhere, worth worth the trip. I need a sidebar. That was a sidebar. Keep going. I'm sorry. I, I was actually involved in that at a little a little part. I played a part in He's that. Like, Listen, but, I know I did it all. Like, no, I, I did. It. I did do. I just I had a little just a little part in it, but uh, it's, it's beautiful. The, uh, the um, but it, but it was more consulting. I was mm. doing more consulting work and just sure. talking to them about um, d different issues that they were running into, uh, placement of tabernacles and things like that, but. Uh, but and I've had several priests in the diocese call me, and and but it was more of consulting, you know, and just sure. they a lot of times, um, uh, pastors just want to, they have some just a little bit of guidance about where to go with something, and then know? they can get yeah, and they can find it, you know. So like, but for me, uh, it would I would where it would start was just someone trying to you know get a hold of me and come out to the monastery is probably the best way that, that'll point you in the right direction and then uh you know and just like look at, i would have to look at the project and find out like how long it would actually take i mean like a se seven year project there's just no way i would i would Maybe. have to, you know i couldn't do sure. that right you know? right sure and uh well george you're a you're a you're a gift to our church i i i'm I love to be able to say that you're my friend. Uh, I'm grateful for all of the work that you've done for our camp out to help us with in that aspect. Yeah. Uh, I ho hold you to a high regard. I, you know, I, I look up to you. I, I love being a, that you're a craftsman. And I, I hope to, I aspire to be one someday. And so, um, yeah, I know I, I just praise God that there, are, that he has still given the world people like you who can still do the things that you're doing because yeah. you know you go see these great works of art it's art especially in um you know the carving and there's like sculpturing and it seems like they're all hundreds and hundreds of years old that there are none that are i mean like i don't i don't encounter any modern sculpture any modern works of art like like what you've just completed that are anywhere close to the level of uh, of beauty you know and so i just i'm just so thankful that this is yeah. not something that is only in the past that we that we can still give the church gifts like this um for mm -hmm. for pl places like the abbey i also i like i know that you do have a deep love for the abbey uh, mm -hmm. clear creek abbey as, um, as we do yeah and and, and uh, anybody who's ever been there it's, yes. it's just contagious yeah, you know it's, no doubt. It, it's just it's a very important place i know that the lord has a lot um a lot in mind to do with the abbey over the generations mm -hmm. and so um thank you for your gift that you have given given to our lady of clear creek yes well i would like to thank you and gentlemen and i'd like to thank you for this opportunity and this podcast that you've been able to set up i think a lot of guys across the country feel the same way that i do of how important this is that you're able to do what you guys do it's very important so and i'm so happy to be here with you guys in this at, at this time you know that we can do this together and we're 
all in the same diocese. This is know, really kind a, of there's huge, there's right, some they, really amazing things happening in the Tulsa diocese. I know if you're really Catholic and you need a place uh, to move, come Tulsa. to Tulsa. We Rare. keep telling people that it like it's such a neat place. We're gonna get it Jim is. Finster to move here. I know we are. <laughs> yeah, we will. It's such a neat place. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank I appreciate you. the time, and I appreciate uh, you, you carving out and, and bringing everything that you did and, and talking to us. Was that a pun? Your... Yes. Was that a pun? That was no, was, yeah. Was that intentional or unintentional? It was intentional. Well, it was well placed, sir. Thank you. I award you another two points. I I got a lot of points to that tonight. That's good. Yeah. That's good. I normally get seven negative. Seven points. You have seven points today. I normally get negative points. Seven points, points so. is a perfect year, perfect number. It took you seven years to complete your, your thing. Yeah. You have seven points. Is ordained by God. We're on the Lord's team. The winning side. So raise your glass. And cheers to Jesus. Cheers.